Okay, well, why don't we get started now? Um, welcome all. My name is Jennifer Boyko. I'm the Manager of Scientific Operations with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, or CLSA for short, as most of I, I think most of you know. Thank you for attending our May webinar on this beautiful hot May day, um, entitled Comparing Measures of Obesity in Relation to Healthcare Use in Adults from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Um, as I mentioned uh, last month, if you were here, the CLSA launched a COVID-19 study in April. To date, more than 27,000 CLSA participants have actually taken part in either our web or telephone-based questionnaire. I encourage you to visit our website um, at www.clsa.elcv.ca uh, backslash coronavirus if you want more information. We're trying to keep that regularly updated. Um, I also want to acknowledge that the CLSA National Coordinating Center, where we normally are, is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. As attendees of this webinar, I encourage you to learn more and to acknowledge the original habitant, inhabitants of the land where we currently and you currently have the privilege to do research, live and work and wherever that may be. So now to today's webinar, uh, comparing measures of obesity in relation to healthcare use in adults from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Let me now introduce our speaker, Alessandra, sorry, Alessandra Andriaki. Um, hopefully I, I, I did justice to that, to your name. Uh, she is a Master's of Public Health graduate from McMaster University. She completed her master's thesis with the CLSA on this project under the supervision of Dr. Laura Anderson. Her research interests include aging, obesity, and body measurement, as well as chronic disease prevention. So I will now give it over to you, Alessandra. Perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, for the land acknowledgement and introduction, and thank you, Shirley, for arranging this and for making sure that all of this is set up properly. Hopefully, we don't run into any technical difficulties, um, but as uh, Jennifer introduced me, my name is Alessandra Andriaki, and I am a recent graduate from the McMaster Master of Public Health program. And today, I'm going to be sharing with you um, some of the work that I completed for my master's thesis. So before we begin and I get into any of the research, I just want to quickly set the stage for this presentation and touch on how we need to reframe the discussion around obesity. So obesity is known to be a disease according to the Centers for Disease Control. So it's important that we use person-first language to eliminate weight bias and discrimination by not labeling a person by their condition. And this goes hand in hand with using non-stigmatizing images and messaging. So throughout this presentation, I'm going to try my best to be using person-first language, and um, the images will hopefully be non-stigmatizing ones. For uh, any more information, if you'd like to learn some more, you can visit the links that I've posted on this uh, slide at the Obesity Canada website and World Obesity. So as a very brief overview, I'm going to begin by um, giving a little bit of a background. I will then introduce my research objectives. I'll describe the methods that I used to investigate them, I'll present some key findings, and then I'll finish with some implications and conclusions of this work. So as a brief background about obesity, we know that obesity affects 27% of Canadian adults, and this is based off of body mass index. Obesity is associated with many different chronic conditions, ranging from um, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and even some forms of cancer. And obesity is also associated with increased healthcare use and cost. So I think it's important to really understand what does it mean to have obesity? So how do we actually measure obesity? And the first way we can measure obesity is using an anthropometric measure called body mass index or BMI for short. And BMI is the ratio of one's weight to height squared, and it's the most commonly used measure in epidemiological studies and in clinical settings. But there are some implications with using body mass index. 
such that it doesn't consider one's body composition. So BMI doesn't dis differentiate between the type of fat, muscle, or skeletal weight. And additionally, there are some implications with using BMI in older adults as um, adults experience age-related height decline that can inaccurately register an increase in BMI when an individual remains at the same weight. And also um, adults go through changes in body composition with age that aren't accounted for by BMI. So the most commonly accepted cut points for obesity is greater than or equal to 30 kilograms per meter squared. And those are cut points that are recommended by Health Canada and the World Health Organization or the WHO for short. Next, we have two measures of abdominal obesity that we could use to assess one's obesity status. So the first is waist circumference. And one's waist circumference is a good measure of abdominal obesity. And we know it's important to look at abdominal obesity because it's been demonstrated to be associated with many different cardiometabolic diseases than just fat in general. The most commonly accepted cut points for obesity are greater than or equal to 88 centimeters in females and 102 centimeters in males. And those cut points are recommended by Health Canada and the WHO. Third, we have waist to hip ratio, which is the ratio of one's waist circumference to one's hip circumference. And although we have this measure, it has been recommended um, by many guidelines and reports to use waist circumference over waist to hip ratio for many different reasons. One of the reasons being is that waist to hip ratio is a relative measure, not an absolute measure. So two people with very similar waist to hip ratios may have very different body mass indexes and waist circumferences. Secondly, um, waist to hip ratio may not identify uh, if someone were to lose or gain weight proportionally from their waist and their hips. We, may not, we might not necessarily see a change in one's waist to hip ratio, but we would see a change in waist circumference. And lastly, a reason why we would use waist circumference over waist to hip ratio is because waist to hip ratio um, involves two measures, so it increases the chance of measurement error. And some commonly accepted cut points for waist to hip ratio are greater than or equal to 0.85 in females and greater than or equal to 0.9 in males. And those were recommendations made by the WHO. And lastly, a fourth measure that we can use to assess obesity is percent body fat. And many consider this to be the gold standard of assessing adiposity using dual energy X-ray absorbed geometry. Many call this DEXA. And um, we may not see this measure being used as often as we'd like in epidemiological studies because it is very costly and time consuming to obtain percent body fat on large populations. The most commonly accepted cut points are greater than 35% in females and 25% in males. And these are um, cut points that are based off of use in previous literature. So next, I conducted a small literature review of studies that looked at the relationship between obesity and healthcare use. And I identified 19 studies. Most of these studies reported increased healthcare use amongst individuals with obesity. But I found the results very difficult to compare and summarize for a few different reasons. The first reason being is that most of these studies only used body mass index to assess obesity. And there were only two of these 19 studies that used waist circumference in addition to BMI to assess obesity status. And of these studies, um, most of them use self-reported body measures to assess obesity. And we know that there's some issues with self-reported measures like height and weight because height tends to be overestimated, weight tends to be underestimated, leading to a general underestimation of one's BMI. And this is especially true for females. Another reason why the results of these studies were very difficult to compare is because they all assessed healthcare use outcomes in very different ways. Some of these studies looked at any healthcare use in a given period of time. Some looked at the number of visits in a given period of time. And this period of time that they were asking their participants to report their healthcare use also varied. Some asked for healthcare use in the previous six months, and some asked for uh, healthcare use in the previous 12 months. These studies all used very different statistical analyses and adjusted for very different covariates, in which most of these studies conducted log logistic regression analyses and reported odds ratios. And lastly, many of these studies lacked the inclusion of older adults in their analyses, and we know that it is important to capture this relationship in an older adult population since the proportion of older adults is expected to rise in the future in Canada. 
So this leads me into my research objectives. And the primary objective of this work was to evaluate the association between anthropometric measures, including body mass index, waist circumference, waist to hip ratio, and percent body fat with healthcare use in the past 12 months amongst community living Canadians 45 to 85 years of age. So I looked at how all four of those anthropometric measures were associated with four different indicators of healthcare use. And those healthcare use indicators were any visits with a general practitioner in the previous 12 months, any visits with a medical specialist, any visits to an emergency department, and having been a patient in a hospital overnight. As secondary objectives, I wanted to investigate if the associations between anthropometric measures and healthcare use differed by sex and by age. And another secondary objective was to evaluate the associations between anthropometric measures, including body mass index, waist circumference, waist to hip ratio, and percent body fat. So in terms of methods, I completed a secondary data analysis using data from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, as you are all aware, or CLSA for short. And uh, very briefly, the CLSA is a national longitudinal study of Canadian women and men aged 45 to 85 years at enrollment. And there are just over 50,000 participants that either fall into the tracking or the comprehensive cohort. And exclusions to Canadians being uh, able to be a part of the CLSA is anyone living in the Canadian territories or on federal First Nations reserves, members of uh, full time members of the Canadian Armed Forces, people residing in institutions, and anyone that was unable to respond in English, French, or provide informed consent. So specifically, I used the baseline data from the comprehensive cohort, which is just over 30,000 participants that have measured anthropometrics by trained staff. And I excluded five participants based off of implausible waist circumference or waist to hip ratio measures, which left me with a final sample size of 30,092 participants. So a little bit about the data design. The data is prospective in nature. Um, and if we look at the timeline on the left here, at baseline or month zero is when the anthropometric measures were recorded. And about 16 to 18 months later, the CLSA had administered a maintaining contact follow-up in which participants self-reported their healthcare use in the previous 12 months. And that little gray shaded area on the timeline represents the 12 month healthcare use recall period. Although this time period varies for participants depending on when their um, maintaining contact questionnaire was administered. And if we look at the histogram on the right, this shows the distribution of the days that participants had followed up and reported their healthcare use. And for the majority, about 69% of participants had their healthcare use um, reported at least 12 months after baseline, meaning that for those participants, that healthcare use recall period won't overlap with baseline and their data is truly prospective. So now getting into the methods I used to analyze my data in terms of um, all my analyses were conducted using SAS and R. And in terms of descriptives, I computed weighted descriptive statistics. So means and standard deviations were computed for continuous variables, frequencies and percentages for categorical variables. After I computed my descriptives, I then wanted to go in and compare these anthropometric measures. So I compared BMI, waist circumference, and waist to hip ratio all to percent body fat, which was my reference standard for this study. I computed scatter plots, Pearson correlation coefficients, and sensitivity and specificity analyses. And then next, I got into a regression analysis. And this was done to estimate the associations between obesity and healthcare use. I first computed relative risks, um, and then I also computed risk differences as an absolute um, measure of association. To compute my risk ratios, I computed generalized linear models with a log link distribution. And then for risk differences, I used an identity link distribution. And both of these analyses were weighted using analytical weights that were provided by the CLSA. I have two models here where I adjusted for different covariates. And all of these covariates were selected a priori based off of rationale and previous literature. And I also used the Anderson's model of healthcare use as a guiding principle. 
In my first model, I adjusted for age, sex, education, household income, urban and rural living, smoking status, alcohol use, marital status, province of recruitment, and follow-up time. And in my second model, I additionally adjusted for chronic conditions and self-rated general health. And the rationale for having the second model is that a lot of researchers um, in previous literature have debated whether chronic conditions and self-rated general health are mediators of the relationship between obesity and healthcare use. So some researchers argued that we should adjust for it. Some argued that we shouldn't adjust for it. So I wanted to see how my um, estimates changed if I did adjust for them. And then lastly, to investigate if there were association, if the associations differed by sex and by age, I stratified my regression models by these two variables. So in terms of results, these are all of the descriptive statistics weighted descriptive statistics for the variables that I controlled for in um, my models. So we can see um, the proportions for all the different types of variables. We can see that there's an even distribution between males and females. So you can see the, distrib or the distributions by the age groups. Um, and if we keep going, we can see the distribution of smoking status, type of drinking. We could see that for chronic conditions, about 70% of the cohort uh, reported having one or more chronic conditions. And here we can get into uh, the prevalence of obesity when defined by different anthropometric measures. So we could see by indicated by red arrows here that 29% of individuals have obesity by BMI, 42% have obesity by waist circumference, 62% have obesity by waist to hip ratio, and 73% by percentage body fat. So we see a very different prevalence estimates depending on what measure we use to define obesity. And for the most part, the prevalence values are similar between males and females. But I would like to highlight some differences between uh, males and females for waist to hip ratio defined obesity, where 37% of females were identified as having obesity by waist to hip ratio, versus 88% of males. So we're seeing very different very um, different prevalence values between males and females for um, this anthropometric measure. And then next, we can get into looking at the proportions of healthcare use in the cohort, where 89% of participants reported having any contact with a general practitioner in the previous 12 months, 48% reported having any contact with a medical specialist, 18% reported being seen in the emergency department, and 7% reported being a patient in a hospital overnight. And for the most part, these estimates are pretty similar between males and females, with females having slightly higher proportions for the first three types of healthcare use. So the next thing I did is I computed uh, scatter plots and Pearson correlation coefficients, comparing each of the measures to percent body fat. And we can see a, the scatter plots here demonstrating the correlation between percent body fat on the X axis and BMI on the Y axis. Females are on the left in blue and males are on the right in green. And you'll see black vertical and horizontal lines that represent obesity cut points for each measure so that we can begin to visualize any misclassification. The top right quadrant represents individuals that were correctly classified as having obesity by both BMI and percent body fat. The bottom left quadrant represents correct classification as not having obesity by both measures. And then the top left and the bottom right quadrants contain individuals that were misclassified by either of the measures. So what we can see here for this correlation between BMI and percent body fat is that BMI is strongly correlated with percent body fat with this correlation being stronger in females having a Pearson correlation coefficient of 0.75, and then the value in males is 0.7. And you can also see their associated 95% confidence intervals. If we look at the correlation between now waist circumference and percent body fat, we can see that there still is a strong correlation between waist circumference and percent body fat, although now the correlation is stronger in males with a coefficient of 0.75. And then on the left in blue, we could see that the correlation is slightly lower in females with a value of 
And then lastly, looking at the correlation between weight to hip ratio and percent body fat, we see slightly different results here. We see a weak correlation overall with a very weak correlation in females as the coefficient is 0.29. And then uh, still weak, but a little bit stronger of a correlation in males with a coefficient of 0.46. So beyond this, I also wanted to look at the diagnostic accuracy using sensitivity and specificity of the cut points used for BMI, waist circumference, and waist hip ratio compared to um, percent body fat, which was my, re my reference standard here. And what we can see by comparing sensitivity and specificity values is that BMI and waist circumference compared to percent body fat have high specificity at the expense of a lower sensitivity. And this is what we've seen in previous literature. But I think it's important to actually be able to interpret what these numbers mean. So let's look at the sensitivity and specificity of BMI-defined obesity in predicting um, obesity by percent body fat in males. So these are these two values that I've circled in red here on the screen. So the sensitivity value of 40.3%, what that means is that of males who tested positive for obesity by percent body fat, only about 40% tested positive for obesity by BMI. So when we have a lower sensitivity like we do here, this increases our chance of having false negatives. And then if we look at the specificity value here of 95.3%, what this value tells us is that of males who tested negative for obesity by percent body fat, 95% of them also tested negative for obesity by body mass index. So when we have a high specificity value like we're seeing here, this decreases our chance of having false positives. So we're pretty sure that when we're letting someone know that they don't have obesity, that it's actually true when comparing um, that to the reference standard of percent body fat. And I just wanted to highlight um, the comparison between waist to hip ratio and percent body fat separately, because we're seeing some very wonky results here as well, like we did um, with our prevalence values and with our cor um, correlation coefficients and scatter plots. So what we see is that um, there is high sensitivity and low specificity using waist to hip ratio to predict percent body fat in males, with the opposite trend appearing in females, where there's low sensitivity and high specificity in females. So this is not necessarily agreeing with what we're seeing for BMI and waist circumference, and these differences in between sex are a little bit concerning. So what I can gather so far is that body mass index, waist circumference, waist to hip ratio, and percent body fat may be measuring different aspects of obesity. And this idea is based off of, once again, the very different prevalence values we're seeing, um, their correlations, and also their sensitivity and specificity. And this also just makes sense based off of what these anthropometric measures are actually measuring. So now this led me into doing my regression analysis and comparing these associations, um, looking at uh, the association with healthcare use. So adjusted for the variables in model one, the relative risks and the 95% confidence intervals are all greater than one. This is telling me that adults with any definition of obesity were significantly more likely to have used any of the four healthcare services in the previous 12 months compared to adults without obesity. And the relative risks for each type of healthcare use don't differ when obesity is defined by a different anthropometric measure. We're all we're seeing that there's increased types of healthcare use for all types of healthcare use and for all definitions of obesity. And then on this next slide, what I'm showing here is the same um, association comparing all measures of obesity to all types of healthcare use, but I've stratified now by age group. And what we can see is that there's attenuated relative risks in the oldest age group, age 75 plus, compared to the youngest age group, age 45 to 54. And this holds true for every relationship except for um, in percent body fat defined obesity compared to contact with a GP. The red arrows I've placed on this slide uh, show where the attenuations were significantly different in the oldest age group compared to the youngest age group based off of non-overlapping confidence intervals. And what these attenuated relative risks, or these lower relative risks in the smallest 
in the oldest age group compared to the youngest age group. What this means is that compared to individuals without obesity in the same age group, individuals with obesity, age 75 plus, have a smaller but increased risk of healthcare use than those aged 50, 45 to 54 with obesity. And some possible explanations for why we're seeing these lower relative risks in the older age group is that perhaps obesity is just not a strong predictor of healthcare use in these older adults. And this makes sense when I was looking at the proportions of healthcare use by age group, where older adults in general just had higher proportions of healthcare use. So it just may be that obesity is just not a, a strong factor dictating whether older adults use healthcare services. And another explanation for why we may be seeing these lower relative risks in the oldest age group is that there may be a selection bias within the CLSA cohort. So it's been reported a few times that the CLSA is a predominantly healthy and educated cohort. And this can be held true um, specifically when looking at this older age group where um, these older adults are a lot healthier than the general older adult population in Canada. And in addition to these age stratified models, I also computed a sex stratified model where I didn't see any differences in relative risk between males and females. So I didn't show it in this presentation. So in this next slide here, I additionally controlled um, for chronic conditions and self-rated general health in model two. So I'm comparing my relative risk estimates in model one compared to model two. And what I conclude is that after controlling for chronic conditions and self-rated general health, that they may be plausible mediators of the relationship between obesity and healthcare use. And this idea or notion comes from the fact that all of the relative risks were attenuated in model two compared to model one. This supports my hypothesis that they're mediators because a mediator is on the causal pathway between obesity and healthcare use. So someone with obesity might then lead them to have a chronic condition and that chronic condition might then lead them to use healthcare services. So if we control for a mediator like chronic condition, we're essentially removing part of that association on the causal pathway. And that makes sense why we're seeing um, some attenuated relative risks after controlling for these two variables. So next step would be to obviously conduct a formal mediation analysis, but since this isn't the primary objective of my paper, and I just wanted to sort of clarify what uh, previous researchers have been debating, I decided just to control some of them in an extra model. So next I'm presenting my risk differences for the association between um, the anthropometric measures and healthcare use. And what we can see is that adjusted for the variables in model one, the risk differences and the 95% confidence intervals are all greater than zero. And this risk difference that I'm presenting here is a risk difference per 100 people, or you can also interpret these values as a percentage. And what um, this data is telling me is that there is a significantly increased difference in the risk of healthcare use between individuals with any definition of obesity and individuals without obesity. We can also interpret this risk difference as there being a significant excess risk of health use that we can attribute to obesity. And what we can do for risk differences, which is pretty unique and what we can't do for relative risks, is that we can compare the risk difference across, across each of the types of healthcare use to determine which type of healthcare use is most associated with each definition of obesity. And that's what I've done here, as you can see in with red circles, is I have circled the greatest risk difference for each um, definition of obesity. So for BMI, waist circumference, and waist to hip ratio defined obesity, we see that there is the greatest risk difference for contact with a specialist. And then for percent body fat defined obesity, we see the greatest risk difference for having visited an emergency department. Although the risk difference for a contact with a specialist is um, in second place, and the confidence intervals are still pretty similar and overlap, uh, showing that there's not a big difference between um, those two values. But I think, once again, it's important to interpret what this risk difference means. So let's look at that first circle that I've, um, I have with a, a BMI-defined obesity and contact with a specialist with a risk difference of 4.6. 
the risk difference for having contact with a specialist in the previous 12 months is 4.6% greater in those with BMI defined obesity compared to those without obesity. And in order to determine what the value is of this um, risk difference or how important it is, is to look at the meaningfulness um, of the baseline risk. So on average, about 48% of uh, participants had reported having contact with a specialist. So does um, an increase in the risk of having contact with a specialist of 4.6% mean anything? Perhaps if we're looking at the risk differences for uh, being a, a patient in a hospital overnight where the unadjusted baseline risk of healthcare use is lower, perhaps a value like 2.6% is meaningful. And once again, um, with this regression model, I stratified by sex and I didn't see any risk, any differences in the risk difference um, comparing between males and females. And I also stratified uh, by age group and we saw similar findings to when we looked at the relative risks where the older age group had lower risk differences than the youngest age group. So into some strengths and limitations of this work. So some strengths of these findings are that uh, I was able to use the large CLSA data set, which enabled me to stratify by age and by sex. It enabled me to apply sample weights to my data to make it more representative of the eligible Canadian population. And it enabled me to control for many different confounding variables. I was able to use percent body fat measured by dual energy X-ray absorbed geometry, which is pretty rare to see in big population studies like this. And um, I was able to assess obesity, not only just using BMI like previous studies did, but I also used waist circumference, waist to hip ratio and percent body fat. Although there were many strengths to this study, there are some limitations to highlight, including the relatively short prospective follow-up period of about 16 months. I used binary self-reported healthcare use instead of being able to link this data to administrative health claims. Those would be next steps, yet it's not um, yet possible within the CLSA cohort, hopefully soon. And there was a moderately long recall period of 12 months for older adults, which may have um, affected their ability to accurately recall their healthcare use. In terms of public health and research implications, what these findings tell us is that obesity increases the burden on the healthcare system. But future studies are needed to understand if these healthcare settings provide the opportunity for obesity intervention and prevention. And these findings are also based off of commonly accepted cut points that are used in clinical and research settings. And they don't say anything about how valid of a measure they are of obesity or how accurate they are. So future research should aim to discern the best measure and the best cut points for assessing obesity-related health risks. In conclusion, and as a summary of all of the work I've just presented, BMI waist circumference, waist to hip ratio, and percent body fat may be measuring different aspects of obesity. Yet, regardless of these definitions, obesity defined by any anthropometric measure is associated with, increase, with an increase in all types of healthcare use in the previous 12 months. And although we didn't see any differences in the association of obesity with healthcare use by sex, we did see that older adults with obesity experience a smaller increase in the relative and absolute risk of healthcare use compared to younger adults with obesity. And lastly, I just wanted to acknowledge everyone who made this work possible and my master's thesis possible. So firstly, my supervisor, Dr. Laura Anderson, thank you so much. Um, to my committee members and my co-authors, Dr. Lauren Griffith and Dr. Emmanuel Guindon, I'd also like to thank, once again, the CLSA, to all the staff, researchers, and participants who made this possible, and also a big thank you to um, CIHR, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, for making this possible. And thank you to all of you for listening. Um, you can ask me questions now, uh, but you're also more than welcome to email me with any questions or comments that you may have. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Alessandra. Um, thanks for the excellent presentation. Uh, like you said, Ed, though, we should now open it up to questions. Just a reminder, the muting will remain on for everyone, but you can enter your questions into the chat box in the bottom right corner of the WebEx uh, uh, menu. So I have to get mine out. I believe there's already a question. 
few questions. Um, uh, where was it? I don't know if you saw it. So, uh, Sorry, I'm – ah, there it is. Uh, so first question from Andrew Patterson. Does the prevalence of obesity differ by age group? Yeah, so I did look at that as well, and I'm just taking a look at the sheet that I have in front of me, which shows that table. It does differ by age group, tends to increase with age group, but not um, anything really different, and we don't see consistent trends between all of the measures when looking at um, whether it increases or decreases as age increases. Uh, the next question from Natasha, are there any measures of stigma that can be entered into, into the models or have you, I guess, considered, of, considered doing that also uh, moving forward? Mm -hmm. That would be interesting. So I didn't, um, I'm not sure if the CLSA reports any um, weight related stigma or any measures of weight related stigma i don't think that they do um but that might be important for future research to look at whether um stigma affects the relationship between obesity and healthcare use because i definitely know that there is stigma associated with both that would be interesting to um look at that effect and i don't think uh i'm trying to recall the clsa questionnaires and i almost certain that we don't collect any information on that. So yeah, that's an I'm area of positive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, were you able to consider BMI changes during the 12 months? So we weren't, unfortunately. Um, so the CLSA is administered. Uh, it was just that baseline where they had recorded um, body measures. And then approximately 16 months later is when participants were contacted for that maintaining contact questionnaire. And I believe that was done over the phone and there weren't any updates of um, any of the body measures. But um, yeah, so there's no way to essentially look at any BMI changes. Although when the next um, round of data is released, then that would make looking at any BMI changes possible. So Cindy now asked, sorry if I missed it, which uh, I think it's easy to always miss some pieces of information, so don't, don't no need to apologize. Mm -hmm. Did the absolute number of healthcare visits differ between age groups to help further understand the attenuating attenuating increase in healthcare use for older for the older older cohort? No. Did the absolute number of healthcare visits differ between age groups? Um, so I'm not sure I'm understanding the question specifically because I'm getting caught up on the number of healthcare visits. So um, the outcome here was a binary outcome of any type of healthcare visit. So in the previous 12 months, have you had any contact with a general practitioner? Unfortunately, we don't have um, the data for the number of visits. And um, if you look at some previous literature, when asking people to self-report their healthcare use, it's actually more valid to be using that binary indicator of healthcare use than to ask them the number of visits. So I'm not sure if I answered that question uh, that you were asking, but um, if we're talking about just binary healthcare use, it did differ by age group. So older adults tended to report um, higher proportions of any healthcare use. Okay, so maybe if that didn't answer it, then Cindy can um, submit a follow-up question to that. But yeah. thanks for that. Um, uh, Adeline or Adeline uh, asked for if, if uh, you can give values according to inches. So I don't know um, if there was a specific part of your presentation that uh, maybe the waste, or maybe if they're mm -hmm. available, um, she might be able to contact you if she wants it in inches. Yeah, you can send me an email. So I, I didn't, I don't think I reported any means uh, for waist circumference or any mean BMI measures and waist circumference is measured in centimeters. So if you wanted that, we would just have to do a conversion and switch it over to inches, but I don't, I don't have that um, available in front of me. Um, next question from Andrew. Uh, when you generated the scatter plots of the various measures, I noticed a lot of over plotting. Using density plots or hexen plots can give a better impression of where the densities are. Um, so maybe the question is, did you consider um, using these other types of plots? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you, it is very dense because there's so many participants that we're looking at. So the plots are pretty heavy. I didn't consider using any of the other measures, but um, I guess the rationale for behind why I just use a scatter plot is I just wanted to see the general relationship, whether it was linear or not. Um, and I actually didn't mention, but uh, the relationship between BMI and uh, percent body fat is actually quadratic, and that's been reported a few times in previous literature. But it was the the notion behind the scatter plots was more of just getting a visual understanding of what the data might look like, although might be um, able to visualize it better with uh, one of those plots that you mentioned. And actually, uh, thinking of the uh, plots that you showed, one of the things that was striking to me was the, the differences in the um, sensitivity and specificity um, when you looked at, at males versus females and also the differences in correlations. Um, again, I apologize if I missed it, but was there any reasons for those differences? Like, I'm sure there, there's obviously differences between males and females, but in, in when you looked at them, they they were fairly significant between the, the sexes. Mm -hmm. And I think you're talking about um, for waist to hip ratio specifically is we, where we saw some big differences between males and females in terms of the prevalence of obesity and then in terms of uh, the scatter plots, the Pearson correlation coefficients, and also sensitivity and specificity. Um, and my, my, I guess, idea behind that is I think there might be some issues with using waist to hip ratio as a measure of obesity at all. And also there might be some issues with the cut points that are used for waist to hip ratio. Um, so I didn't dive into that necessarily in this research. That would, I think, be a totally separate question. But it really questions the validity of should we be using waist to hip ratio at all for um, looking at obesity? Um, but definitely still something very interesting to highlight and to let people know about. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, I think the questions are slowing down. So just a reminder, if you do have any questions, please uh, post them. Uh, but it looks like maybe this is the uh, one of the last, the last one from Andrew. Uh, are you planning similar analyses for self-reported height and weight in the tracking cohort? So that would be our um, telephone cohort. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. Um, not necessarily planning for it yet. Um, this work was just finished, freshly finished uh, like a month ago when I defended my thesis. Um, but it would be interesting to look comparing self-reported weights. Um, we know how those tend to change based off of measured weight and height, but also just looking at um, change in um, those measures after the first follow-up, so that the first follow-up data will also be released soon. Yeah, that's a good point. As we go on and we have more of the follow-up data released, something else to look at would be the longitudinal nature of the changes. Mm -hmm. uh, so Tasha now asks a question: Would you recommend? Would you recommend using percent body fat to measure obesity? Good question. I keep asking myself that question because I don't know the answer and this work definitely doesn't um, give us an answer to that question either. I guess it depends on like what is the, what, what does having that uh, obesity by percent body fat mean? So what are the health risks associated with having um, a high percent body fat? And what we see in this cohort is that I think it was about 69 or 70 percent of individuals are identified as having obesity by percent body fat cut points. So do we think that truly 70% of the cohort is uh, has obesity? I'm not sure, so I, I don't think so, but uh, it depends on how valid of a measure uh, percent body fat is at uh, associate, uh, looking at the association with obesity-related health risks like cardiovascular disease or diabetes or even mortality. Good point. Okay, another uh, question from Andrew. In the type 2 diabetes field, there are different BMI thresholds used for screening based on ancestry. Is there any literature related to ancestry for obesity? There are different BMI thresholds used for screening based off of... I'm not sure that I'm understanding what um, ancestry means. Are we talking about like uh, hereditary obesity, ethnicity? Okay, I think that was his follow-up. Um, 
Oh, yes. Okay. I know what you're talking about. Like cut points for obesity that are ethnic specific. I think that's what you mean. Yes. Okay. Um, there are, I've, I have seen uh, like BMI specific cut points, especially for waist uh, circumference. And even there's some literature on using ethnic specific cut points for percent body fat. So the CLSA cohort, I think is predominantly white. So over about 90% um, self-reported their ethnicity to be white, which is why I didn't look into any ethnic specific cut points. But there definitely is a whole abundance of research looking at um, whether we should be recommending ethnic specific cut points for different body measures. Good point. Um, Sarah, to your question, yes, the presentation will be available on the CLSA website, uh, so you can, uh, you'll be able to access that. Um, okay. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, as I go through my uh, last uh, few bits and bytes here, uh, if anybody has any final questions, we can, uh, you can try to, we can uh, stay on and address them at the end, or again, uh, we can take note of them and you can email them backwards, or backwards, uh, afterwards. Um, so again, thank you again for such a great presentation. Uh, we really appreciate um, you doing this as we appreciate all of our uh, presenters every month. I'd like to remind everyone that CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. The next deadline for applications is June 17th of uh, next month, so mark it in your calendars. Please visit the CLSA website under data access to review available data, further information and details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their survey, which is located under the polling option. It may have also popped up for you. If you don't see it beside the chat button, please click the, the drop down there. Um, we are finalizing the details for our June webinar, but please check uh, our website next week for more information and to register. Uh, we will be providing an update and exploring opportunities for researchers to engage um, with the CLSA as, a, as the focus of next month's presentation. So if you are interested in engaging with the CLSA, whether it's as a trainee, um, as a researcher, I think that next month's presentation um, will be sure to, uh, you'll be sure to find that interesting, hopefully. Uh, and remember, the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ALCV. So thank you again for uh, today's presentation. And, uh, and uh, yeah, congratulations on your uh, defense, Alessandra. And uh, thank you. I see there was a, a question. Maybe we, you can stay on and uh, address uh, the last question by Saman um, at the end. But for uh, the most part, we'll consider the webinar complete. Perfect. And thank you all for listening, for tuning in, for asking questions. This was awesome. This was fun. Do you want to just relation? Uh, yeah, sorry. If you wanted to just address that last question that came in, if uh, uh, Simon is still on, if not, they can email you. But go ahead. Of course. And I'll take a look at that last question. So that last question is asking, do you think it would be possible to use fat surface area on CT scans with regards to abdominal fat to also do this sort of population data. So that's a question I'm not sure I know the answer to. I'm not sure of how valid a measure of fat surface area by CT scans is at assessing um, obesity, if it is a valid measure of obesity and uh, the health risks associated with excess fat. Um, so you might be able to find some studies that might tell you a bit more about that surface area. I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not necessarily sure about that one. Great. Thanks, Sam, right. good question. Well, uh, everybody, I hope you enjoy the rest of the week and uh, we'll see you next month. Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>